good evening everybody we are moving to the third technical session here we are having two talks by two eminent personalities the first talk is delivered by professor r vaidyanandan professor r vaidyanandan has completed his phd from jncsr bangalore in 2003 thereafter he moved to liverpool university of liverpool as a post doctoral fellow in 2003 till 2007 thereafter he joined in university of calgary as a research associate currently professor r vaidyanathan is associate professor at the department of chemistry iiscr pune his research interest include designing porous solids to capture and separate carbon dioxide and other industrially important gases also designing chiral solids and developing hierarchy of inorganic and organic solids with properties ranging from insulating to semiconducting and conducting he has more than 100 publications to his credit and have a us patents granted for work on water splitting he was the recipient of many awards and fellowships including 2018 iusstf research funding by indo us 2018 chemical research society of india medal and 2019 materials research society of india medal with these few words let me invite professor r vaidyanathan for delivering his talk on the topic hard soft gate control to tune dynamicity of a family of mofs so please thank you sir thank you so much for the kind introduction and uh, i would at this outset like to thank uh, the organizers and all the chief uh, people involved in making this a uh, nice meeting happen so my sincere thanks to you all and uh, thanks to all the participants and the students who are joining to listen to this uh, series of talks i hope uh, my talk can uh, share some new information and something interesting with you okay so then uh, please make full screen okay yeah sure so yes so essentially in our group we work on frameworks on its Uh, and then we try to make them from a molecular level uh, all the way to a material so that is our uh, bigger uh, aim and uh, today i'll be talking to you about a very specific work that we have done where we have introduced porosity into a metal organic framework which is otherwise non porous by using a special chemistry and uh, very very fundamental but special chemistry uh, which we have uh, kind of coined it as hard soft gate control okay and uh, so especially the idea is uh, what is the bigger goal that we have we essentially want to develop porous materials as molecular seals which can have high separation capacity for specific gases okay so for example you look at uh, power production you generally burn a coal and you generate the heat and the heat runs uh, generates steam and the steam runs a mechanical turbine and then the mechanical turbine gives you the electricity but one of the by products of electricity is co2 and we know that co2 is a very harmful greenhouse gas so releasing it back into the atmosphere is not a great idea in fact the co2 was very safely stored inside the coal before which had taken several years but in no time we are releasing that back into the atmosphere and uh, that is not a good thing you see so that is now it is very important that we capture the co2 okay uh, from uh, this emission and then find a better way to process it so that it doesn't go directly into the atmosphere so this is what is called as a post combustion co2 capture and you need to develop very good capture materials to selectively capture co2 from a mixture which is containing co2 and nitrogen because nitrogen is what is present in excessive amount um, so so that is a whole idea okay and meanwhile 
there are other processes which are going to generate a, a rich stream of methane, which is a potentially valuable gas for several energy related usages, but that also again is uh, generated by burning biofuels and stuff. So there is a lot of CO2 associated with the methane and you need to develop separation procedures for that. These are our uh, areas of interest. Uh, and then if you look at literature, uh, sorry, before I go to this, I'll give you some fundamental things that a gas can be, one of the best ways to separate a gas from a mixture is to use this concept of adsorption, where you have a surface which is highly polarized, and then you introduce a gas which is neutral to start with, but you can now see that the neutral gas gets a polarization because of the surface's polarization, and there is an interaction between these two species, and that is going to generate what is called as adsorption of the gas on the surface. So developing porous materials is a way to have several such uh, fundamental uh, gas capture procedures being executed as a material uh, for large scale capture of gases. So please and, uh, note down the word large scale because the amount of CO2 we are trying to capture is several tons per day. So which means it is not a simple process. So you need very efficient adsorbents which are kind of something that can be recycled quite easily and so on. So one of the common materials which people have been looking at for quite some time is metal organic framework. And I won't go deep into this because most of you know it. So simply, I look at metal organic framework as something that is derived from a metal oxide. So these green balls are metal and the oxide O2 minus ion is the blue ball. Now, if you replace this oxide ion with a long organic linker, which again is a two minus charged species, and which can coordinate with the metal, you can simply expand this cube to a much larger size. And now this size becomes more suited for molecular sieving or molecular recognition, okay? So that is where MOVs are attracted a lot of interest. And also these every red line, what you see here is a surface, okay? And these are the surfaces where gas molecules can interact very well. It can interact with the red line as well as the green ball, which is a metal center. Now you can see that uh, by subdividing a big cube into a smaller cube, you can increase the surface area very systematically. So which means a longer linker, if you replace by a shorter linker and divide it into smaller cubes, you have a chance of having very high surface areas. Now you can see to give you a feel for it, what is the surface area I'm talking about? So for example, a MOF, one gram of a MOF can have a surface area which is 10,000 meters square per gram, which is equivalent to an entire hockey field, okay? So that much of surface area can be generated by one gram of MOF, which means if a small molecule is starting to fill this hockey field, you can imagine how much surface of hockey field it can fill. That much a MOF, one gram of MOF can absorb and fill. And a single gas cylinder, if you fill it with MOF, uh, uh, it can take up what six gas cylinders of compressed CO2 can take up in just one cylinder. This is another way to understand what we are trying to achieve. But whatever I have said so far is the bigger goal what we are aiming for in our group. But today's talk is going to be on a very specific type of interaction that CO2 presents with a MOF and how do we control that, okay? So this slide is slowly getting into that. So here, what it is a very nice work from Jeffrey Long and co-workers, and uh, uh, the, this was published in JAX. So what they did is they show how from an equilibrium absorption isotherm of carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrogen, you can see that the MOF actually is, for example, let us look at the blue curve, which is the methane. It is absolutely non-porous methane up to a pressure of about 18 bars, okay? So to give you a feel for it, our atmospheric pressure is one bar. So this is well above the atmospheric pressure. So up to 18 bars, there's no uptake of methane, but then suddenly the MOF changes its phase or structure, and then you're seeing a gushing of methane into the MOF, and then it saturates to a much higher value. You can see eight millimoles per gram of methane gets absorbed. Now let us look at CO2, what it does in the same MOF. You can see, unlike methane, CO2 starts to absorb very much from a very low pressure. 
okay, almost like 0.1 bar or something. And then it immediately starts to fill up the MAF and then it is taken up rapidly. But this also shows some mild structural changes. That is what these type of features represent, okay? So now this gray area, can you see this gray highlighted area? This area represents the area where you can collect a large amount of CO2 selectively over methane if you have a mixture of CO2 and methane, okay? That becomes very interesting. Uh, I'm seeing some yellow lines of the screen. I don't know why. Uh, is everyone seeing some yellow lines getting drawn on the screen? I'm seeing some yellow lines. Somebody is drawing. Okay. I hope uh, that will go away. Okay. It so, will not go away till you finish. Uh, now okay. What people people do with all kinds of uh, their graffiti. <laughs> uh, well, let us carry on. Maybe someone is hungry. <laughs> All right. So this gray area represents the area where you can achieve high separation of CO2 over methane. But the beauty of this thing is, look at how the structural change in a very uh, solid material, like a MOF, is caused by a gas at a high pressure. But look at the pressures, about 18 bars. That's where the methane is able to cause a structural change. This is a very good example of why these structural changes can become very important when it comes to achieving high selectivity for specific gas over other gases. Now, what is the structural uh, change that we are talking about? So this is one type of structural change, okay? This is called breathing of a mouth, just like lungs breathe by contracting and expanding. A morph can also contract and expand. And that kind of a phenomena is called breathing behavior. And you can see there is a five angstrom pore size change or overall pore volume change is five angstrom when a morph goes from a, a kind of a um, closed structure to an open structure. And five angstrom, you can imagine in terms of molecular dimension, there is such a big change, okay? Which means a gas molecule which cannot access this phase can access this phase because there's a five angstrom extra space available per volume of the MOF material, okay? And if you look at it, how do you track these things? People do single crystal X-ray diffraction from which you can solve the structure. And one of the parameters that you typically follow is the lattice parameter. So A, B, and C. So the parent phase is the orthorhombic, solving in P and AM space group and has the following lattice parameters, which is like, uh, like a cube if you have A, B, C, but in a cube, all this will be same number, whereas here it is different. Now you look at the high temperature phase of the same MOF, the lattice parameter has substantially changed, at, but still it is orthorhombic. And now this is representing this phase, okay? And then there is an intermediate phase, which is neither the asmid nor the high temperature, but a low temperature phase, which is completely a different structure in monoclinic with the entirely different lattice parameters. So single crystal X-ray diffraction or sometimes powder X-ray diffraction is a nice way to follow these type of structural changes. But the most important thing is we are going to be talking about structural change caused by a gas, whereas this is a structural change caused by desolvation assisted by temperature. Okay, but the type of structural change is breathing of a mouth. Now, you can see a variety of structural changes that are possible in a mouth. So one of them I explained already, breathing. And there is another one called swelling. So uniformly the mouth expands in all directions. Then it becomes like a sponge, which after absorbing water swells up. So it is another kind of change a mouth can show, which is called swelling. And then another very interesting one is linker rotation. So if there are linkers present in the MOF, which is the organic part of a MOF, it can rotate and reorient itself so that there is an openness created in the MOF. So a MOF which was impermeable to a gas molecule can become permeable after this molecular structural change happens. And then you can also have something called as catenation assisted openness, okay? Catenation is something where one network penetrates into the other network without actually making a through bond connection, okay? And such networks which are catenated, if they shift because of a gas molecule coming in, uh, or if the gas molecule has enough ability to force the structures to move, then you will get openness introduced because of loss of this. Uh, I mean, the catenation is still true, but the shift in the independent framework is different now, okay? Same way you can have 
movement of interdigitated mouse. So interdigitation is like fingers going like this, okay? This is called interdigitation. Now, since it is very easy to move this or open this, that can also cause you uh, uh, openness to come in in the presence of an external guest species. Same way, you have stacked layered mouse. They can slide between each other and organize in a different fashion to generate pores through which gas molecules can go in. So these are different types of dynamic uh, nature that a morph can show uh, via external guest induced forces. Now, this is one of the work from my own group, which we did a while ago, where we show how CO2 can have a specific uptake okay, at a, say 303 Kelvin, which is room temperature, and you do not see any change in the morph okay, at this. Uh, uh, this is an isotherm. So I'm looking at, as a function of pressure, the uptake of CO2. And you can see it is having a rapid uptake and then it saturates and uh, there is no steps in this. Whereas when I go to 293 Kelvin at around 80 millibar of pressure or millimeter of HGA, sorry, not 80, 800, you can see there is a structural opening and there is more CO2 going in. That same phenomena starts to shift to a lower pressure as you decrease the temperature, which is expected from Charles' law. The fundamental Charles' law would tell you why the gating pressure shifts to a lower pressure as you decrease the temperature. And you see that, but at 195 Kelvin, the structure does not show any such a flexibility, but is very open and a lot of CO2 is able to get in. So this is what I want you to look from this slide, but I'm not going to explain a lot about what is going on and stuff for this material. We are going to go into the work that I want to talk to you about, okay? So using this flexibility of a MOF, what we are trying to ask a question is, can we introduce porosity into a completely non-porous MOF by a controlled route, okay? So what I'm going to do, I'm going to try to introduce gas selective pressure dependent porosity into a ultra microporous magnesium isonicotinate MOF. And what is special about our approach or our study? Typically, all this flexibility, dynamicity, what I showed you will be associated with a MOF which has long linkers or flexible linkers, okay? Because these are required to make the MOF act like a sponge. But we are trying to see, can we come up with a method where even in a MOF which is made of very short linker, so the linker in our case is isonicotinate which is 4-pyridine carboxylic acid, okay? That is a very short linker compared to some of the linkers which are already reported. Can we introduce openness into this type of MOF? What kind of chemistry can we do, okay? So the chemistry what we are going to do is what is called as a hard soft gate control to introduce porosity into otherwise non-porous ultra microporous MOFs, okay? So the magnesium isonicotinate structure is shown here. The green balls are the magnesium, okay? And it is connected by the isonicotinate ligand. One end is connecting through the pyridyl group. Another end is connecting to the carboxylate group. The red balls are the oxygen atoms of the carboxylate. The blue balls are the nitrogen atom of the pyridyl group. The gray balls are the carbon of the benzene ring to which these groups are attached. And the green balls are the magnesium centers, okay? So now this has a nice three-dimensional structure, but with one-dimensional pores. This brown color representation I'm showing are what are called as Connelly surface diagrams. And you can clearly see the black region, which is actually representing the open pores is very small in this MOF, which means it is practically non-porous. And if you carefully look at why it is non-porous, the pyridyl uh, bonded groups, adjacent ones are rotated by 90 degree with respect to each other. They are not staggered. Okay, because of this, they block the porosity in both the direction. Think of it like this. If I keep it like this, this direction porosity is blocked by this one. This direction porosity is blocked by this one. So both sides are blocked. So there is not really an openness to the structure, but it is a very stable, beautiful MOF framework. Now, I do an adsorption with this MOF, okay? And I'm noticing at 195 Kelvin, it shows very good uptake of CO2, okay? So the pressure on the x-axis, CO2 amount adsorbed on the y-axis. And this is the isotherm at a fixed temperature. Each of the curve represent 
measured at a particular temperature. So now at 195 Kelvin, I'm able to see a very good uptake of CO2. And as the temperature increases, the uptake falls, which is expected because adsorption is an exothermic process. But there is a gating that you can observe at higher temperatures. And this gating makes a structure which is almost practically non-porous. See, you can see before this point, almost only about point three millimole per gram of gas is being taken up. But after this point, the gate opening happens and you are able to take up as, as high as two millimole per gram of CO2. And this gating now is what I would like to control in this MOF via a new chemistry, okay? And you can see as the temperature is lower, the gating pressure comes to a lower pressure. As the temperature is increased, the grating pressure goes up. This is expected because lower temperature represents higher pressure by Charles law. The higher temperature represents lower pressure by Charles law. Okay. Now I am trying to see is this uh, openness that is coming in due to CO2 partial pressure, is it because of structural change? And I am measuring a variable temperature XRD of this sample. And from that, I am looking at that uh, trends that the lattice parameters are showing. And I'm seeing that A axis does not change much. B axis does not change much. C axis is also not changing much, but the unit cell volume shows reasonable change. And most importantly, the monoclinic angle is showing a good change. And the structure parameters are given here for this magnesium isonocoordinate MOF. You can see it is a monoclinic P21 space group and beta is non-90, others are 90. So this is the beta angle. I'm showing you that it is changing continuously as I increase the temperature. So there is no major structural strain. If there is a major structural change, I already showed you the entire lattice parameter will change. So that is what I'm seeing. But I'm also seeing that the material is able to show beautiful uptake of CO2, which can easily be removed by a sweep of nitrogen. And again, you can uptake CO2 and you can again sweep it down from a nitrogen. So I can do multiple cycles of CO2 absorption, desorption on this material, but only above the gating pressure, not below that, okay? That is what I'm showing you here. And then we are also seeing uh, by kinetic measurements, we are calculating the diffusion coefficient for the CO2, and we are able to see that it has very favorable diffusion coefficient or self-diffusion coefficient for CO2, even though it is a very small pore MOF, but this is only after the gating has happened. Now, we resort to computational modeling with the help of a fantastic computational chemist, Professor Tom Wu from University of Ottawa. We have been long time collaborators with him and we have done some, he has helped us with some very, very crucial inputs in several studies of ours. So in this case, what he has done is, he has calculated uh, several configurations of the MOF by rotating the pyridyl units and then identifying the energy associated with several different configurations. And then from the whole range of studies, he has identified only five configurations have favorable thermodynamically acceptable energies of which one of them has the relative energy, which is the lowest. The others have uh, slightly higher energies from that configuration, okay? And this is actually the configuration of the, from the single crystal structure. So this is the experimental configuration, okay? Oh, I'm sorry, this one. This one is the experimental configuration, whereas this is a eclipsed configuration. This is uh, like the open, most open configuration. This is partially open configuration. This is more partially open configuration. So there are different configurations with different levels of openness and the associated energies are given here. And in this, we find that the conformer 1D, which is the open pore, Okay, conformer 1D gives absolutely the highest uptake of CO2, okay? But this is not matching the experimental uptake, okay? Whereas the CO2 at 273 shown here is the experimental curve, okay? And the closed conformer is 1C. You can see this one is the most stable form, okay? And this shows only this much uptake. So actually, what we have in experiment is something in between these two configuration, and that is a metastable phase. That is what we have in experiment. Now, if I calculate the uh, 1D, which is the most open pore, 
which is not necessarily the experimental one, and calculate the isotherm for that using a Grand Canonico Monte Carlo simulation, I am able to see that the uptake matches quite well with the saturation uptake of the experimentally observed sample. Okay. Now, this is an interesting study. What they have done is a molecular dynamic simulation where what they have taken is 16 CO2 versus 48 CO2. So 16 CO2 represent a pressure of 0.15 bar in experiment. 48 CO2 represents a saturation pressure, which is 1.12 bar, okay? That is atmospheric pressure. Now, here is the dihedral angle change with respect to the rotation of the pyridyl groups about the metal. And we are able to see the angles do change significantly as you increase from 16 CO2 to 48 CO2. And I won't go into the details of this, but what it says is the structural change is not happening at a lattice parameter level in terms of A, B, C, but it is definitely happening at the rotation of the pyridyl groups and the dihedral angle it makes with respect to the plane of the material, okay? Now, uh, then what we did, how did we gain control on this gating? We made three different MOFs, okay? The exactly same structure, but three different MOFs, okay? So all are isonicotinates. One is made with copper, one is made with manganese, and then we have the parent one, which is with magnesium. Now, if you carefully look at it, the magnesium is a very hard center, whereas the pyridyl is a borderline soft acid, okay? Manganese is a hard center, okay, but not as hard as magnesium, okay? Manganese two plus, magnesium two plus. Whereas copper two plus is very soft. So it matches the PVC much better, okay? In terms of soft, soft, okay? Now, this is the systematic we adopt. And then we call, what is it called as coordination flexibility? That is the ability of the coordination to be relaxed and then be able to rotate about a bond, okay? That is what I call as coordination flexibility, not something like where ligand leaves and comes back. As what you see in catalysis, that is a different type of flexibility. This is more to do with the rotation of the ligand about the coordination point, okay? That is what is a coordination flexibility. And we are controlling that coordination flexibility by using different metals, by keeping the same ligand, we are showing that how the softness, hardness mismatch can introduce a degree of freedom for the rotation and how the gas pressure can exploit that. So here is the adsorption isotherm experimentally measured for the copper, manganese, and magnesium. And you can see that the gating pressure at the same temperature, if you are measuring the gating pressure, it is a particular pressure for the magnesium, okay? You can see that, the brown color. So it is somewhere around 0.16 bar, okay? Whereas the same gating pressure for manganese is at a higher uh, value in terms of pressure, okay? Because here, this is little softer than magnesium, which means uh, you don't need a lot of force to open the gate. It is very easy to open the gate of magnesium. Whereas for manganese, you need a little bit of force. Whereas co copper, which is very soft, you don't need any force. It is always open, okay? So because of that, you don't even see a step in the isotope. Okay, so you are beautifully able to control this gating phenomena by using hard soft gate control. Okay, that is what we call as hard guard, hard soft gate control. So essentially, if you look at the structure, the magnesium and the manganese isothalate, the al alternate pyridyl, pyridyl rings, okay, they are rotated with respect to each other by 90 degrees. So you need to rotate it to a 60 degree angle so that they all are equivalent. If they become equivalent, you will be having more openness in the structure. And that is what happens at this particular pressure of CO2. They rotate the ring to gain the openness. Whereas in case of copper, always it is in an open form because it is a soft, soft. And because it is always in an open form or it continuously rotates, you don't need any special force to rotate it. It is always available form. And because of that, you don't see any gating. That is what I'm trying to show here. Now, Essentially, the, in summary, what we have seen is that initially we are able to let in only one CO2 per unit cell, okay? And that is the 1D form because only one direction is available for the CO2. But when you rotate it using this whole range of configurations, we have mapped it. When we rotate it to a specific angle, which is 45 degree in this case, we are able to get the maximum openness 
at that point the morph becomes a 3d open morph okay uh, so and that explains uh, how this happens and also here you can see the open pore is represented by a dark red color the completely closed form is represented by a represented by a dark gray and you are moving as you rotate the pyridyl groups you are moving from one configuration to the other and the configuration which has maximum number of pyridyl groups falling at this 45 degree those configuration have the maximum openness this all has been done through extensive molecular dynamics calculation where we freeze the framework and the co2 is allowed to introduce freely and several snapshots of the molecular dynamic configurations are taken and they are taken a statistical analysis then you identify each of the data point as a statistically analyzed point then you get a equilibrium isotherm from which they are claimed this okay so i think i have another 5 minutes i quickly conclude okay so here is the a uh, new morph we made the iso iron isonicotinate morph which is the analog of the same other morph what i discussed so far but there is a catch i will not go into all this this behaves just like the other ones shows the gating everything but what happens i'll show you this is all i'm going to skip yeah here this is the most important thing based on the hard soft gate control for the gating pressure for this iron morph should have been somewhere here okay the dotted lines is what shows where the gating pressure should have been okay if it had been a fe2 plus but in experiment i am seeing that the gating pressure is at a much lower pressure which means it is opening very easily it is not needing that much force of co2 to open it and this is completely against what you would expect because manganese 2 plus is a harder acid compared to iron 2 plus but you are seeing that it is falling below in terms of the pressure which means you are having more hardness at the iron side this completely made us wonder what is going on okay then what we did we did xps as well as magnetism measurements and these two shows us the sample is rich in iron 3 plus not iron 2 plus and the beauty is if you go back both iron 3 plus as well as iron 2 plus both can take this octahedral geometry with equal ease though iron 3 plus has slightly better propensity for octahedral geometry compared to iron 2 plus this iron 3 plus usually takes it very easily you understand so the iron 3 plus is what we have in the sample then we had to revisit our single crystal structure based on this analysis and then we see that what we have is a high spin iron 3 plus complex then we have reassigned the formula sorry sorry for going back and forth so we have reassigned the formula what we have is a iron 3 plus isonicotinate which means we need a anion to balance the excess charge on the cation and that comes from the extra framework hydroxyl ions and that explains why this is able this is even harder looking than the manganese and that explains why the gating pressure is lower for the iron sample compared to what manganese is showing so we in fact corrected our single crystal structural uh, uh, kind of assignments based on this deeper thought okay so the hard acid gate control is again established back in the sample so we were very glad to see that these are our recent results so with this i will conclude my talk i would like to thank my entire group and the the work was mostly done by human and shama he is a postdoc with professor christian sere in uh, france now and debanjan also did some of the work he is also with professor christian sere and rahul very recently joined belgium and um, and human is my phd student currently and the cp helped me with the xps and kiran deep with the magnetism and tom wood did all the calculations with the help of his phd student mr phil galuna and i would like to thank all the funding bodies as well as our directors for giving all the support and i thank you all sincerely for your attention to this talk and i'm happy to take questions now the session is open for discussion participants can participants can raise their hands if you if they want to unmute well let me ask a few question that is um, um very nice in this talk thank you when you look at different uh, configurations of any given molecular system uh, don't you see 
also mixed configurations. Yes. And what is the effect of these? Uh, possible, the very much possible. You're right. So for example, um, that is what the molecular dynamics calculations are telling us. So though we are arresting at a given point, a specific orientation of the periodic rings, for example, in reality, the whole study shows you that what actually simulates the experimental isotherm is a mixture of these configurations, not just one specific configuration. So this is with respect to the ligand, okay? And same way, in case of the iron, the magnetism study as well as the XPS clearly points out that there is slight contribution of Fe2 plus also in the structure, which means though I have given a formula as FEPVC uh, dot OH, there is a variation in the amount of OH than a fixed formula. So both ligand as well as uh, metal sites can be having a mixed configuration. I totally agree with you on that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, sir, can I ask one question? Please, please. Uh, hi, Vaidhinandan. Yes, Excellent yes. talk. Really Thank enjoyed you. your talk. Very nice. Mm -hmm. I just had one Q question uh, regarding the gating phenomena. The gating phenomena was fully attributed to the hard uh, soft acid based principle. Yeah. Uh, I just, uh, it's not a question rather than a curiosity. Do you really think that uh, the size of the metal ion, if you are keeping the um, ligand apart, the size of the metal ion has any influence in dictating the gating phenomena? Because the larger the size, the conformational flexibility for the uh, ligands to rotate will be more easy. No, in, in fact, in fact, uh, Raji, the hearts of acid gas control textbook definition itself takes care of that. See, when the size is small, charge is high, that will be hard center. When the size is large, with the, for the same charge, it will be a soft center. Okay. Yeah, so the, I was is, not asking that actually. So huh? when you have, uh, I mean, la, um, uh, higher, I mean, larger metal center, when you are talking about the rotational freedom of the ligands, that will be more, right? Or I'm just thinking in that. Direction. No, it, that's what you're right, because the larger metal center will be a softer center for pyridyl ligand. Okay, but it is not always the case uh, for all types of ligands. Yes, pyridyl is a soft center. Okay. Yeah, okay. Okay, thank you. Yeah. The session is open for discussion. Participants can uh, raise their hands. If... So either the talk was very clear or <laughs> it was not going through them. Uh, I think uh, we can move to the next uh, okay. section. Before thank that, so before that uh, let me uh, thank Professor R. Vaidyanathan for his excellent introduction on gating the carbon dioxide absorption by using pressure. He also demonstrated to us how the gating can be controlled by modifying the hard and soft base characteristics of the cations involved. It was a wonderful uh, ex experience in listening to your talk, sir. On behalf of the organizing committee, let me express our sincere gratitude to you, sir, for your wonderful session. Thank you. As a token of our appreciation, we will be uh, sending you uh, this uh, memento to you uh, in person. Thank you, sir, for your wonderful. Thank you so much. It's so beautiful. So beautiful. Yeah. Thank you.